Welcome back, fellow armchair generals and railway enthusiasts. This is Gamer1745 here with my good friend, the new IKB. Say hi, IKB. Hello, everyone. And he and I are going to be playing Railway Empire, continuing our look at very early railway development, particularly in Britain, but it's just where railway started. All right. Well, we have to continue along here. We need to mind everybody our tasks produce 60 loads of tweed and connect london to liverpool currently we cannot do further connection than birmingham so i am presuming it's not clear that we need to um get the tweed um produced before we go to uh further south all right okay so we have a connection bonus here and ikb and i were just talking about this uh two hundred thousand. we have leads here which is has a lumber yard and they need lumber particularly so a little bit of a geographical based issue here so we're going to go with a warehouse we're going to put it outside here and make sure we have enough space to build bridges and hopefully points Effectively, and even both sides of the. And if worse comes to worse, we can always put the points on the other side of the bridge. Yes, that is um, uh, what may become a definite possibility. We don't want it to be large. Now, okay, well, Nottingham and Hull may also eventually need lumber, particularly. Um, so let's, let's place this right about like that. Um, we're going to leave enough space with a cement quarry. If when we decide we want to incorporate that into our rail network. And yes, there is enough space. Very good. Okay, so we have that built. We need to designate the warehouse to receive lumber. And we also need to make sure we put a um, water tower and maintenance facilities somewhere. Yeah, that is likely to be a good thing too. I was hoping to avoid, but we can't. Um, so we might as well just do that. We are, okay, we have the John Bull. Um, have we upgraded everything to John Bulls? I don't know that we have. I don't think we have, no. So that's going to be our, our John Bull on that track. Okay, well. Let's put this on here. Okay, now. Did that. Bit expensive, yes. Um... What we should see about well we've got to save up some more money hopefully we can do that hopefully we haven't messed this up we still have the save that we can go back to if we need to because i do want to build um we gotta get five hundred thousand to build a weaver factory that'll be our next another and that we need to uh increase our tweed production which means uh more dark satanic mills yes more more dark satanic mills and that is definitely a i don't know i still have to wonder what what they thought of them um we definitely think of them that way and i'm 
I'm sure that, uh, I just, you know, people's perspectives, were they all at wonder of the machinery or did they, and their expectations were not well-lit areas or were they, you know, um, seeing that as just some sort of god-awful place? Okay, they're, yeah, they're about ready to get to the... I think we might need to put in more water towers. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have enough here to buy our weaving factory. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, try to put this so just in case if we need to, we can still add. One more station, I think that'll. Hmm. Also looking at bringing that around this way is maybe a more higher priority, just in case we need to connect warehouse three. Okay, so that just about broke us, which is fine. We're going to be making money. Railways make money. Do they still um, make money in Britain? Um, they they are supposed to, but um, there have been. A few notable, occasion, uh, notable occasions of um, train operating companies, um, or at least the, the part of the company that is in charge of their railway operations, either running out of money or simply giving up. And there have been a few occasions where then their franchise that they're running has had to be taken over by the government to have, surprisingly enough, not done a bad job. Yeah, um, instinctively, I am not in favor of governments running businesses. doesn't mean they can't or they shouldn't. It just often doesn't work out for the best. Okay, well, we need to connect um, Fraser Estates now up to the warehouse here outside Liverpool. Now, Psychab and I were just talking Fraser Estates. That is... Uh, hello? Hello? Did you oh, hear that? I heard that, yep. Yeah. Oh, I think, um... It looks like someone's tried to jump into our chat. Uh-oh. Hey, yeah, Eric, yeah, um... Yeah, you need to disappear, please. Hello? Yeah, 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 hello. Yeah, my RTX voice was acting up, and I had to change it immediately. Okay, um, we're making an episode here now, oh, and so we... Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, no problem. Okay, uh, uh, thanks. Bye. Okay. Okay. Um, so that, okay, everyone. Yeah, that's Eric. He's a, he's a pretty good streamer in his, I guess, RTX, which is a new technology, um, and I'm using it myself, but um, can have some problems. Okay. All right. Well, we're back on track. Boy, um, live TV and recording. Okay, so, oh, let's pause this. So the Fraser Estates, as I was saying, for interrupting, either the um, Scots have moved awfully far south with their herds of sheep, or the English have gone in for branding their um, production with Scottish wool. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, yeah, I think this is where we'll do this. And IKB were, and I were also saying that he knew a few Frasers, and I've definitely known a few Frasers. Um, knew some that were involved in a Scottish clan organization. And the interesting story with that is there, in America, there's two basic Scottish clan organizations that are um, Frasers. One of them, it basically requires you to be a um you know related to the clan Fraser. the other one actually requires you to to not only that but have the last name of Fraser. so you can you can understand that everybody is named Fraser in that order oh you gotta put the points in before we do that and so i heard the story and i believe it to be true i wasn't there but um i knew two of the people um, three guys were riding in a car one day here in California, pulled over by a police officer. Um, don't know, you know, I don't know that they were doing anything particularly wrong, 
Um, and so, you know, the police officer pulls them over and, you know, asks, you know, at some point, you know, what's your name? Uh, David Frazier. Okay. Well, you know, and there's these other guys in the car. And like I say, it's a Scottish clan organization and they had been like coming back or something around a Scottish Highland game. So they um, had a bunch of um, swords and things in the back of their car and the officer notices this at, at some point during this stop and sort of jerks back and what what what's all this in the car kind of thing and you know they sort of explain somewhat quickly and you know okay and then but you know with a flashlight looking in the back uh, like looking at the passenger seat what's your name david frazier now remember i just said that he had asked the driver his name was david frazier yeah yeah okay what's your name in the back david frazier Okay, get your IDs out. All three guys were named David Fraser. I knew one of them as David Dew, which Dew is um, Gaelic for black, because he had long black hair. The other one I knew as Fiddler because, oh, he played the fiddle. So, yeah, um, you can get that kind of interesting situations when everyone has the same last name. Okay, so we have now our problem, I think, here is the lack of wool. So what we're going to do, I think, is take this one here instead of a new one. And we're going to move it. Oh, well, first we need to accept the delivery of wool. Yep, of wool. So that is done. And now we're going to switch this and get rid of that. No. To there. Okay, so hopefully that will, well, it's going to run empty the first time. Are you sure you said it to take wool and not um pig? Uh, yeah, I actually told it to. I'm in the habit of sometimes putting uh, warehouses next to the resources instead of just having the estates. So I get in the habit of telling it not to pick back up that resource because uh -huh. otherwise so it it'll back to the. Yeah, it'll it'll deliver some, and if there's some still in the warehouse before it gets transferred to the city immediately, it'll bring it back. So it's sort of a habit I've gotten into. Okay, let's get a stoker who we can maybe set up to be a um, speed demon here on the rocket. Now, let's go, okay, well, we've already got these guys, so what we're going to do here is... Um, spend our money and upgrade to the John Bull. Now, the John Bull, oddly enough, ended up being an American locomotive, but it was built in England and then shipped over to one of the first railway lines in America. Ah, okay. And when it, sometime after arriving in America, they decide to rebuild it slightly. And it ends up being the first locomotive in the world to have a cow catcher. Ah, right, yes. The, on the front of American locomotives, you often see this sort of big arms, sort of flatted V-shaped wedge that's designed to uh, throw cows and buffaloes off the track as you're going along. Right. There, there, there is a picture right now you can see as a cow catcher is what he's... Uh, thing of that what he's describing here and that is a very common thing up um at least until um it's, you know it's just their sort of designs now i guess to a degree incorporate um something that is to remove debris or blockages um on the railways because just the scale and the size and it, so it's going along i don't know it's probably uh, clearance of a couple of inches above the rails, but not not much more than that. So if there's 
something lightweight, but has fallen over it, it will probably deflect off as opposed to get caught under the wheels unless it's really small. So that is sort of, but yes, it's called a cow catcher. And um, what they don't do in Britain, um, well, no, they really do. They don't ranch in Britain. They um, have cattle farms, which we have back east, but out in the west um, we ranch, which comes from the old uh, or Spanish rancheros, which uh, basically we let the cattle be wild and um, as opposed to keep them, um, you know, in fields with fences. And it's best to have all the trains on a particular set of railways with the same engine so they don't start bumping into each other as one we're moving, moving significantly different speeds than the others. Now, of course, I do have a personal story to tell here on the grounds of owls and railways. Is that I okay. have, in the past... When I've been at work on the on the railways, I have been uh, called out along with some of my colleagues to help deal with cows that have gotten on the wrong side of the fence. Mm -hmm. And we then turn up and find that no, it's not a cow, it's actually a rather large bull who uh. quite clearly does not want to go back to the other side of the fence and has decided that the grass alongside the edge of our railway line looks much more appealing. And so we then ended up chasing this really rather you know, very large bull up and down the side of the railway line for an hour or so until the farmer finally turned up with the feed trailer, at which point he, the, the bull rather promptly decided, ooh, feed trailer, I want to be back that side of the fence now. Yeah, that's an interesting story. Um, similarly, Pav, you know, everyone knows Pavlov and his dogs. He was the person who... I, I um, would ring a bell every, I think it was a bell, every time he was getting ready to feed his dogs. And so, you know, after a while, he could just ring the bell and they would all be coming wherever he was salivating, thinking that they were going to eat. It is very, very true. And it goes for humans as well as animals. Um, on the ranches that I was around when I was growing up, um, there was... In it's southwest California, so there was most assuredly grass and even more um, sagebrush for them to eat. But the amount of cattle on the land that was sort of set up was, was greater than it was easy to for them to um, you know, feed off of. So they would bring in, you know, um, baled, what people who don't know would, would see it as hay, but it's often alfalfa. Um, hay bales basically in and, and um you know sort of cut the wires and dump them off the back of the you know the pickup truck well they had honked the horn so these cattle would come to your car or truck to the back of it if you honked your horn so it, it, you know and just as um stupid kids of course we were um periodically not not too much, but periodically fooling the cattle by going somewhere, honking the horn, and, and they would all, hey, Lum, how you doing? They would all show up and, um, you know, wonder where the food was. Okay, bad condition. Well, okay, bad condition. So we need to add a... Um, yeah, we'll do, we're going to do it here. Because if we put it, well, I don't know, warehouse may have been better, but if we put it there, then... Um, Try and go into know. warehouse 6, won't get it. Right, or vice versa. So if we keep them at their destiny, or at their starting points, that will keep that. Hopefully. Okay, looks like we are going good enough, so we're going to upgrade the trains on this line and so yes combination of um, wearing or knowing how to use the proper hat 
and the hat um and then of course colloquially it's a cowboy hat but it doesn't have to be a cowboy hat but the idea of the hat is is you take it off and you sort of wave it um uh at the bull or the cows or whatever it may be and um doing that in the air is a bit more than just having your hand in the air so it encourages the cattle um i don't know if scares them but definitely it's something a little bit more waving in the air than just your hand so that is um that and then having something like you said feed trailer or um some other uh, motivating factor is a good way to get cattle moving okay you're on this section as well station master well okay yes we will go with a station master we have a chief engineer an accountant he will streamline work process of the stations and they like each other okay good now we still have our connection bonuses here No, we were talking about cow catchers on the front of trains, and then we got to talking about them cows or cattle. Okay, well, we're going to generate some funds here by um, at least pay for a getting a station now by just simply. I don't know that either of these places were going to immediately be. It's awfully steep terrain. Okay, oh, we, oh, we built that maybe wrong. I don't. Yeah, we couldn't get it too much closer down in that valley. I don't think. Okay. There we go. Paid for that. Oh, let's. We're just going to leave that alone for the moment. Sounds something like like a. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's what it is. That is exactly what it is, Lum. You can see here um, what a cow catcher looks like on the front of a train. It's to deflect cows and other objects off and away from the train as opposed to say it will be just like i don't know an inch or two above the the rails um the bottom of it so hopefully it does the flex materials instead of going under and getting caught um under the the wheels of the the trains and although nowadays they're not on trains or at least modern trains as i'm thinking they generally it's sort of incorporated as you probably can imagine since your line of work something like that in the design anyways but very common on the old steam trains in america now catchers are very much a thing either in um mostly in america australia most you know sort of the whole of the americas including canada and South America and sort of Australia and parts of Africa, mainly because those are places where you've got large amounts of fairly large animals roaming more or less freely, be they um, you know, animals that are domesticated as in ranched cattle or you know, large wild animals such as um, buffalo and such as buffalo and bison in America or um, if you're in Africa, things like elephants. Yeah, and and you know you no, I don't know what's what I'm saying. Yes, you proved right. Um, and so you know, I say domesticated cattle. Yeah, but ranching, almost the cattle are basically going back to wild. Um, it's not quite a you know binary choice between wild and domesticated when you're talking about ranching cattle, but uh, a lot of the cattle that are the ranch that I've ran. You know, yeah, cows don't, you know, really like you walking up next to them in that way. And um, 
Yeah, if you if you're the feed truck delivery, they want the food more than they're worried about you coming up next to them. But they're not like um, farm cattle, and so it's it's a different sort of thing. And I was taught that the cattle um, are sort of afraid afraid of you, and will run a, run away. Um, if you sort of approach them, get too close to them. Now, the big problem with cattle is they're as likely to run towards you to run away from you as to run away from you, away from you. And so they just, you know, get going, you know, thinking that, oh, well, just sort of the direction that they're looking, let's just run. So and sort of run you over. So, yeah, that's I was definitely taught to be wary of cattle. OK. We um, let's see what would it cost to buy this. We don't have enough to even for the starting bid, so which I don't think there'll be any other bidders. If we want to increase, so we need enough money to both. Okay, Nottingham wants to be connected. We want Nottingham connected. That is where we're going to spend our money. Uh, of course, okay. hopefully if we connect Nottingham we will get a huge tourist trade as people go there to um go looking around for um Robin Hood stuff. Ah. Yes, I wasn't even thinking that until you, you got to the Robin Hood part uh, as associating that. Yes, okay. And I'm sure that would be a thing in the nineteenth century, because the the romanticism of Robin Hood definitely picks back up at that point. Mm hmm. Okay, trying to think about orientation, and uh, I think we maybe should just start going with large stations now for better planning, because we can hook up I mean, from multiple directions here. And they're giving us a eh, not a great bonus, but. Enough to be able to pay for this, I think. Of course, another thing to remember is that at this time, even the locomotives are comparatively actually quite light to the point where a reasonably large animal such as a cow could actually pose a you know, significant derailment risk. And it's not going to be the, the cow is not likely to, to survive the to survive the engagement. But the, um, the locomotives at this time are definitely light enough that a, a cow would be enough to cause a derailment. I can, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. They they weren't doing um, in the American West when the you know are getting a bit, because at least my understanding for things like the John Bull being in America, those days we're talking very much um, trains in, at least as a as a Westerner here myself would call the East. You know, definitely east of the Mississippi, and so yeah, there is um, you know. That's where you get farms and cattle are much more controlled. There aren't roaming herds of buffalo uh, and all those kinds of good things. But um, when they do sort of really start incorporating that as they're moving west, there is real reason to do so. Um, it's not just, it, you know, for some benefit of the cattle or something, it's it's a significant threat. Okay, so there, that's connected there. Let's come over here. Oh, we got it. Add in all the relevant signals. Yep. So that our trains know which track to take and where to stop, so they don't run into each other. Yeah, that's mildly important, especially the don't run into each other part. Okay, I'm going to 
Get rid of these two signals. To do some sort of slightly better placed wait here. We're free after this point. Put signals there. Hopefully that's good. Maybe we need to think about upgrading the station in Manchester. Yeah, and I'm thinking about we're needing to redo the last bit of this railway after doing so here. So let's, yeah, I think we have the money to do so. So let's come in here and do this. There we go. Okay, so what we want to can we put a temporary. We're going to kill that section of the railway here. Hopefully that will be good. Okay, we're going to get rid of that. There we go. Okay, that works. Let's get rid of the extra water tower. I still think of these as water towers. And we're going to put this here. So, and now here, let's redo this. Yeah, that isn't going to work. So in Manchester, we need to specify um, that track there. And that should work. That'll work better. As railways in the UK start to pick up, there suddenly becomes a whole plethora of different railway companies. And especially for large cities such as Manchester and Liverpool, you will quite often, you'll very quickly start to find you two three four maybe even more stations and there's no guarantee there's often um not actual you know railway connections between them so you it would not uncommon for people to find themselves having to get off of one train with all their luggage and then you know, go across town to get to another station to get on another train with all their luggage because yeah. the different companies had not yet connected themselves up for free running and were still you know were very much you know Cutthroat, cutthroat capitalistic competition trying to you know, steal passengers and weren't always too keen on having a direct connection because they were worried about you know other you know, other companies trying to use their lines and you know, working out you know, okay how are we going to charge them for that do we really want to allow our rivals to have access to this part of town to then take away some of our traffic yeah and that's you know, that's Part of the, the, shall we say, problems with, with railways, is it a um, business or is it um, national infrastructure? Well, it's both, but that is where the, if you will, the conflict comes in, as I would, I would say. And at least my understanding in America currently is that um, basically all of the commercial railway lines that are, you know, in operation, any train company can run trains on them. They just have to pay. And I think there's a 
standardized rate of you know how much per mile or whatever it is for per car per whatever so you can own you know just a section of track that somebody owns that is connected to everything else and any train company who's running trains along that that section of track has to pay um the sort of standardized fee for it so um you know which i think is ultimately the solution so that people can build railways where and when they you know like if there's going to be a mine somewhere and okay well we need to connect that up to the the national railway grid um you connect that up but then oh hey here's the, uh, this other mine over here who's going to connect up to it you know so it's all a standardized setting standardized quality and so if you know if you're this you know these aren't mines here but if this mine which track connects to here and this mine here uses half of this track well they have to pay for using that section which is cheaper than building their whole new um, track hey Ari. so i i think that sort of works as a um, reasonable compromise okay how are we doing with wool production okay we've got to 18. okay we've got that sorted i well these guys getting any wool yet um, no. Look like it. Um, yeah, we, we still need to see about saving up enough money up and expanding everything. Or, yeah, we probably should buy Fraser Estates. Be American I'm capitalists up. and buy the resource. Where do we come over here? Well, that's going to cost a lot more getting from Hull because we have to come around. Uh, we'll have to we go have to down and around the yeah. um, territory we don't have access for. Yeah, and because either because it would be easier to connect it to this warehouse and then connect that up somehow, but we'd have to come around over and to this warehouse. Just take a long time. Uh, Cornelius agrees with mass building of railways. Cornelius Vanderbilt, of course. Um, yeah. Who he's meant? Who he's talking about? We don't missing equipment. What are we missing? On that? Right. Um, it may be either a supply tower or yeah, it's, it's just going tower. between those two. It's not going to get yeah. Tower. Okay. Now, of course, we're trying to save up for buying the. Wool farm, but. Um, I think Vanderbilt did um, invest in railways. I don't know if that if that was his main thing. Okay, well, I think we have enough money to go for this. I don't think we're having competitors in this scenario, so there will be no other people bidding against us now of course in the uk we have our own sort of equivalent to cornelius vanderbilt which was george hudson who was known as the railway king okay he at at his he started off in york in york and he basically in through various financial dodgy dealings of somewhat questionable nature ends up in control of more than a thousand route miles of railway track in terms of he's you know, either on the board or he's got or he's the company chairman of an awful lot of different railway companies and he's actually um you know, sort of quite well approved of by london high society until all of his dodgy financial dealings eventually catch up with him and get revealed and at which point he gets basically voted out of all of his company chairmanships by the board of directors nah. and it's sort of like you know, how the mighty have fallen <laughs> yes yes we're going to keep um new locomotives cheaper than we're going to do 
um, auction cheapness. So we'll keep our current. Well, they're not boards of members of the boards of directories. They're the main um, department heads, I guess, would be the proper terms for those. Okay, well, now we have more wool production here. Uh, no, we're not just buying random businesses. Oh yeah, Vanderbilt was definitely into shipping at some point. Very. Upgrades. What's it um, cost? Automotive technology was advancing rather rapidly. So it was quite common for locomotives, instead of being out and out replaced, for them to be rebuilt to incorporate new features. Okay. So if you look at the um, the original rocket, which is currently sat in the um, and I believe in the national, I believe it's in the National Science Museum. Well, no, I think they might have moved it. Um, in the UK, it actually looks quite a bit different to how it originally, because it has had rather a um. It's currently in the science, it currently, science museum, and it currently looks quite a bit different because it has been. You know, it was quite heavily rebuilt over the years to incorporate you know, new developments as technology moved along. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Is it no longer of, um, the sort of character? It's sort of characteristic, um, you know, highly sort of forty-five degree angled cylinders were rebuilt to be at a much shallower angle, much closer to the horizontal, to sort of reduce the hammer blow of the um, pistons being transferred to the track and other okay. such things. So it was quite heavily re rebuilt. There were yeah, a lot of, I... yeah. And there were a lot of other locomotives for you know throughout history that often got rebuilt or in some cases for purposes of finan of getting you know various projects approved by the um, financial side of the company. A lot of things that were uh, for on you know for budgetary reasons that were classified as rebuilds were actually essentially new locomotives but were classed as rebuilds and maybe used a few parts from the old locomotive to get around you know financial things from the, from the financial side of companies such as you know, the board of directors saying you know, we can't afford to build new locomotives but they will somehow magic up the money for upgrading and rebuilding old ones yeah, I don't normally think of things in that those kind of terms, but that does make a lot of sense. 
And yes, Ari, I have heard, um, and I think it was leaked, um, uh, Crusader Kings coming out in September. Crusader Kings 3 coming out in September. Um, Steam or somebody, I think, leaked it. Uh, I'm getting ready for the idea of a um, shitstorm of um, disappointment over CK3. The reason I say that is, how do I put this? Players' expectations. And I don't know that Paradox has learned its lesson yet. They, um, and again, I know that I don't know that everybody's interested in all this, but it's something I guess I'll talk about for a moment here. Paradox, of course, really before I, well, I mean, I played the original EU, the original EU before it was EU1 or whatever. And I played the hell out of the game. But I wasn't aware of the idea of that there was even a company of Paradox. It was just, hey, this is this Europa Univeralis game that's really cool that, um, you know, bought. And, but from some of the other titles, releasing, ti um, releasing titles that were sort of buggy and really required... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, patches and whatnot. And they finally got past that and they were releasing or games got really, really good. And then particularly with releasing Hearts of Iron 4, they announce it out that it's happening before it even goes into beta, you know. And then it doesn't work. And... Uh, I really shouldn't say much because, I mean, I don't know a whole lot. I only know about it once it actually get got into public beta. So it was part of the beta test team, and I'm not supposed to talk about what happened inside of that. But we can talk about what we know was re what was released was really bad AI and a lot of other stuff that was just not done. But what really, that was that was the big problem with it. But the secondary problem was is that Hearts of Iron 3, with their finest hour, was a rather rich, well-developed game. And here you're releasing a bare-bones game. And a lot of people saw it as um, cutting things out of the game to then sell you DLCs later on instead of, you know, it's, you know I don't know, $60 game. Sorry, I don't pay attention to the original full price of everything, but I think it was like about 60 bucks. $60 game, and then they're going to do a bunch of DLCs. So, you know, they should have just, instead of selling us for $120 or whatever, they're just going to piece, piece it back out to us, blah, 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 blah. Well, I can assure you that that is not what Paradox was doing. They didn't cut a damn thing out of Hearts of Iron 4 compared to Hearts of Iron 3. They actually, when they released it, there was a whole lot of new features like production of equipment and things. But what people didn't realize and or didn't expect, because this is as much about player expectations as anything else, is that... Hearts of Iron 4 was a whole new game built on a whole new engine starting out. So they didn't cut anything. Now, not all the features that were in Hearts of Iron 3 were in Hearts of Iron 4. No, absolutely not, because they had to be built. They weren't yet built. It wasn't a matter of cutting. It wasn't they haven't built it yet. Now, that can be a very valid criticism. They haven't built in spying yet. Well, now, of course, with La Resistance, they've built it in because there was spying in Hearts of Iron 3. It wasn't in Hearts of Iron 4 at release. Now, that's a very true thing. It wasn't in Hearts of Iron 4. I'm not saying that there wasn't missing elements 
and um i know um podcat even very much commented was is i have a lot of really I'm, I'm paraphrasing it's not exactly what he says but this is the spirit i have a lot of really cool things i want to do with spying um and so i just didn't want to put in some you know again these are my sort of phrasing for what he was saying half-assed um features just to, ha to say oh we have spying blah 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 no i want to do this i have some really cool ideas and as you can look at I, I think it's a little too long-term setting stuff up, a little too focused on one thing for the spying, but I think a lot of the, the new spying features are really cool. So they've done that. They've, they've excelled by leaps and bounds what the spying was. Now, maybe they haven't quite matched every capability in, in Hearts of Iron 3 spying and Hearts of Iron 4, but they've, 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 and what they've done, they've jumped a generation past it but it's taken how many years now to develop the stuff and so when they get there you know and so this is just the way with paradox games are not going to be complete on release this isn't buying uh, uh an rpg game um sorry i don't like play fallout or whatever um but you know, something like that, that the whole game is sort of, you buy the whole game to play through, and you play through it, and you're done. And that's the whole thing. They're not doing this to, you know, at release to having the, the thing go gold, which was the old term of a, sort of a master CD, go gold and ship that out there. And that's all you ever needed to touch. And you, you've had the complete game until you want to, like, continue the story, you know, part two, part three, part four, whatever. Um no, they're putting out a um, base strategy game. And okay, but they don't explain it well. They don't manage um, players' expectations well. And then you come out with um, uh, Imperator Rome. Now, to the best of my knowledge, and I know it's improved, but to the best of my knowledge, and I played it, the AI, and this is the AI that, Paradox has a lot of experience with in like EU and Crusader Kings that it does well is sort of grand strategy AI where it doesn't do the combat AI of either Hearts of Iron 3 or Hearts of Iron 4 well. And I don't know whether they just haven't hired the right people or whatnot, but um, or it's just maybe a maybe they've hired the right people at the budgets that they have, but it's just really hard to program that AI. That I can very much um, acknowledge as a possibility. So, but it was Imperator Rome was not a very rich game. It had some cool features, you know, a sort of a mix of CK, which I've only just barely played. And like I say, played the hell out of EU one and two. And now just touched a little bit of three and four recently for playing. So you guys know who watched that know that I'm not terribly great with EU four, but yeah, I you know so I know what that is, and so it's sort of a mix of that. Put you know for Imperator Rome, and what they did of it wasn't done bad. I think it was done very well, but it was just very sort of base level. All the countries were sort of the same. Yeah, you had, what, four different sort of religions that had maybe slightly different effects. It just sort of all sort of bland. And I will readily accept and, and agree with any of those kind of criticisms. And so players' expectations. So I, I look at it. I I want to state, because, you know, I people know I, you know, because of, again, beta testing and, other things with paradox have a bit of a relation, you know. So they, I sort of know these some of the people, and they sort of kind of know who I am. It's, we're not best buddies or anything like that. So this is not coming from any any inside information, but I think everybody realizes that um, Imperator Rome was a as a failure. Um, I'm not saying it was an entirely a financial failure, like they lost money on it or anything like that. I don't know um, if they have. But I think it was a is a failure, and they realized it. So they've improved things with it. They're adding more richness. And so I think it's as much about managing expectations, either what people expect from a Paradox title, 
which now, of course, is pretty damn low, or um, what they expect with um, CK3, CK25, CK whatever. And see, this is so... And I don't know that they, they've learned their lesson yet. Again, I just don't know because I... But my expectations is, is they're going to release something that has significant improvement over CK2, but won't have however many years, because I don't know right offhand, histories of DLCs of adding richness to CK2. You know, all of that that's been added won't be in CK3. And that's really going to upset a lot of players. So I'm just waiting for that to happen. Um, but maybe it's been in, in production a lot longer than I or most of us know, because we do, did know that there was, a, what, almost two years ago now, they announced two, um, at one of their convention things, two um, project heads or secret projects. Now, of course, and I forget who, but we all sort of guessed one of the guys, you know, had previously been working on CK. We guessed that, yeah, that he's working on CK3. And so that could be, you know, two or three guys fitting in a, you know, in a room um, on desks working away at that. Or that could be 15 guys, you know, you know, three artists, a sound guy, a what, you know, and it could be all kinds of people really working at a production of it. I don't know, you know, how how they're how busy they've been working at it for how long. But if they don't really knock it out of the park with CK3 at launch, I'm in no way saying oh like Paradox is doomed or anything. No, it's not. It's pretty damn secure. Um Hoi 4 I sort of think, unfortunately, is very popular because it doesn't meet my needs of what I want a uh, World War II strategy game to be. But it does seem, because I want it to be a bit different, but it does seem damn popular. And their Surviving Mars, I think, is doing well. I know Stellaris is doing very well. Um, so they're, they're, you know, they're, they've got a lot of good stuff. So, But if they don't do one of their flagship ones and just knock it out of the park, um, it's going to be a major disappointment in my opinion. So that's my thoughts on um, CK3. It's just either they got to do it really well or it's going to be seen as a flop. Okay, well, on that note, um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, like the videos, and say good evening, AKB. Good evening, everybody. And so we'll be back um, soon with more Railway Empire. Thanks so much. See you next time.